you know. If that makes sense. Well, it makes sense. Um, not pretending to quite understand it yet. Ah, we're making it onto YouTube. <laughs> yeah, I saw it. It says your live stream. Well, this, um, might be, this might be an interesting kind of analogy, but, you know, symbiosis happens most commonly between um, particularly the mycelium with mushrooms. So there are certain mushrooms that will only grow around certain trees and under no other condition will they grow. Mm -hmm. um, a good example. So in that sense, I mean, their, their, their life is entirely depends upon that tree and the nutrients that it can derive from that tree's root system. Um, and in no other condition can it grow. So I think he's just drawing an analogy saying that, you know, the same is true for an inferior part of one's personality. It might be, it might hitch its wagon to the dominant function, but it's only sustained in that hitching to the dominant function. I like the example with the mycelium because that's been very much specific culture to an identity being the, the fungi, the mushroom, where it only thrives or even exists in those conditions. That's, that's an interesting example. I, I found interesting the part about that the um, introvert needs to, at some point in time, exercise himself uh, uh, decisions and, and, and putting, you know, uh, some will into his um, introversion in order to manifest something. And the extrovert needs to reflect upon himself, where in fact the extrovert is constantly manifesting objectivity outside. So that is something interesting about that. What does the extrovert need to do? Not manifest objectivity in order or, or send it back inside and work with the subjective in order to make the decision integral. Therefore uses the subjective that can't make decisions plus the, the uh, thrust that has a superior function of projection. So by bringing it inside, it meets its opposition and it, then it can, when it comes out, it's more whole. That's, I'm glad you pointed that out because actually that, I, I like this and for the extrovert to reflect upon himself um, yet without endangering his relationships. The last line piece of that is a little curious. I'm, I'd like, someone else to see what they say but the extrovert to reflect upon himself rather than outwardly projecting upon others so that it's not always a putting it out i think that's what i was trying to get to um when i tried to make my example but that extroversion that needs to pause and reflect rather than always either effusively or just even actively acting so whereas the introvert needs to find a form of action, the extrovert needs to form, find a form of action within in the reflection. I've got something I want to kind of throw in the stew here. Um, and I might, I might be wrong on this, so I'm just kind of interested to see if this plays or not. But it's my impression that I think introverts project a lot more than extroverts. I think that might be what um, he's saying here, yet without endangering his relationships. Earlier in this chapter or in this book, um, Jung talks about the introvert's hesit hesitation and mistrust of the object. And I know mm. I can personally attest to that, but I also would say that it's almost always the case that as an introvert, my idea about an object, whether it be a person, an experience, or a thing, often goes before my experience of, of the thing. Mm. Um, I tend to idealize things a lot and um, often feel that things don't quite meet, don't either, um, yeah, don't perhaps meet my idea of the thing. And I don't think that the same is true for extroverts so much. Um, they tend to just have 
complete trust in the situation, just go meet objects and things outside of themselves without any hesitation. Mm. Um, so I'm wondering if that plays for anybody else or if that's just idiosyncratic. Mm -hmm. No, that's resonating. Um, the jumping out, jumping in extroversion versus the not reclusive, but more pulling in or staying in of the cave in a way. <laughs> I guess Plato's Plato's cave, you know, you're in the cave or you're coming out of the cave. I mean, it's we're yes. kind of where 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 are you standing? Are you standing in the entry to the cave? Put on both sides. I mean, that's that's a really that's a good point, Nick, and for the question there. I have a question for Nick if you're done, Jordan. Yes. Oh, so Nick, one thing is do you equate shyness with introversion? as a result of what you just described. And secondly, uh, when you say that you thought introverts project more than extroverts, are you meaning just in his or her own mind? Um, or projecting psychologically onto, or onto a situation? Okay, so the first part of the question, uh, equating shyness with introversion, I personally, it, I think it would be difficult to parse that in the general, but I would not say that that's true of what I'm attempting to say necessarily. Okay. Okay. I don't, I personally don't think of myself as being that shy. Um, I'm just a little um, kind of hesitant about, <laughs> um, about things and doing doing things in the external world. I like to think and and have discussions about thoughts more so than I like, uh, you know, going and doing things, if that makes any sense. But, um, but anyways, the uh, second portion of it, what was the second question? Well, it just, I think the question is, in what form does that projection what form does that projection take? Is it just within the mind of the introvert or is it part of the interactions? Part well, of the interaction, sure. Well, I understand idealism and I understand having that as a player in an interaction, but right. I, and I wasn't clear how you saw that as playing out in a mm -hmm. situation. Yeah, I am. Um... It's difficult to put language around it, but I guess what I was trying to say with that was just that I often, um, uh, the impression I have of things or the expectation I have of things in my mind versus things in reality are often a little bit different. I can certainly idealize things, even if it's something as simple as a meal, going for a meal, expecting it to be the feast of all feasts and, you know, it, being so you know, yeah. wonderful time and really just being like oh you know this is this is okay um and you know it's easy for me to slide into idealism sometimes but i do keep a pretty close check on that and try to try to balance that with realism as well but i don't think i can really separate and make a distinction between that just in thought and in my own mind and the way that that then conditions my interactions you know, Ray, I'm glad you brought up shyness because it feels that really prompted me to think <clears throat> that introverts are shy to the objects and the environments outside of themselves and extroverts seem to be shy to the objects and environment within themselves, potentially. The, that the shyness is pushing the extrovert out and the shyness is pulling the introvert in in a way as to which that's there's a real magnetic resonance in terms of how is the shyness operated in that calculus yeah thank you for sharing that because i think what jung is trying to say is that when there's a dominant function the one that is an extrovert fails to reflect and just goes out and does and the one that's inside is busy reflecting and fails to actually manifest. And it's all about the balance between the two. So um, that, that's kind of like what he's getting at. Like making the point that no single portion should be a limelight hog. You know, they all need to get their due course of 
their say. I, I just want to give an example, and I also just want to say I'm kind of sticking my neck out with all of this because this is all quite um, quite revealing, I suppose. Um, but you know, my in terms of um, doing things and shyness about things and things in the external world, my kind of go-to response for going out and doing things is often just right out of the gate. No, I'm all right. <laughs> um, my, uh, my partner, Savannah, her father is coming to visit this coming weekend. And she called me and asked me if I wanted to go ride horses with them on Sunday. And immediately I was like, nah, like I'm okay. I've got school, I've got schoolwork and stuff. I've got thoughts to tend to. <laughs> that stuff I have to do on Sunday and like that's just my initial response you know like mm -hmm. I'll probably end up going with them mm -hmm. but it's just kind of my first base mm -hmm. my dominant and primary response to say like eh, I don't know and then I'll come home and think about it and be like yeah why wouldn't I go do that so yeah, I can temper my introversion with my secondary function and, and if we choose to talk about it that way but that is my first response to say mm -hmm. eh, let me think about it first i guess well, nick you're you're not the only one in the world i have a friend of mine and if i call her hey you want to go get a bite to eat she'll be no i'm seriously busy but then she'll send <laughs> yeah. me a, she'll text me a picture and she's sitting there in her robe with her book and her cup of coffee <laughs> just hanging out and at home near the fire you know and that's the busy you know but mm -hmm. that's important you know so i get it and yeah, that's deeply well, really cool. Now let's apply my uh, my shorthand for this. Okay, the extrovert can see a thousand trees and not believe there's a forest. The uh, I'm sorry, not the extrovert. The sensing person sees a thousand trees, but doesn't believe there's a forest. The intro uh, intuitive um, sees three trees and they assume there's a forest. And so you probably don't need very much, Nick, in order for you to say, nah, I don't know. But then, then a few more facts get laid in, like this is Savannah's father that's coming. That must be important. And oh, by the way, this is what they're doing together. If I want to be part of that family, maybe I better do some things over there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and it's really refreshing to go hang out with Savannah's father, too, because he's very much an extroverted uh, sensation guy, you know, kind of a, a business guy, very much in the external world. And it's, yeah, it's, it's refreshing to hang out with somebody like that, but it's difficult for me to keep up at the same time. You know, Skip, I like your shorthand. It, it reminds me, I don't know if you have it handy, that correlation does not equal causation picture that I had sent you with the cat on the parking structure? I don't remember. Mm. I'm losing short-term memory. <laughs> oh, okay. It was, it was a couple of weeks ago. I think there was a picture where those, you know, the three trees and people assume they're a forest introvert and then see a thousand trees and assume, and then still don't believe there's a forest where there's a, I sent you a picture where there's a cat sitting on a damaged carport, but it, the caption says correlation does not equal causation. So there's the, like you said, drop in a couple more facts in there with Nick, and then he may start to modify what he's looking at in terms of his decision. Yeah. 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 So my shorthand for introvert and extrovert is, an introvert will go to a party and they'll sit over in the corner and talk to one person or a couple. And um, an extrovert will be in the middle of the room, yucking it up and telling jokes. <laughs> and um, so, you know, I, I don't know where we all fit. I've been accused of being both in the last week. So, <laughs> yeah, this is, I don't know if it'll show. Yes, I believe that. Oh, yes, 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 yes. No. <laughs> this is correlation does not equal causation. The cat's sitting right at the valley of this, you know, destroyed carport. Right. And mm. <laughs> so the but fact that cat doing that view. But the cat didn't story. do it, you know. No, the cat didn't do it, but it sure looks like it. That's a good one. Yeah, I think I we all carry different percentages of both. Uh, 
and um, exercise sometimes according to the uh, Petri dish, which is like the Petri dish is the circumstances around that that sustain what you're able yeah. to do. Um, mm. Then either or or whichever one will surface. Sometimes it's the trigger, the weaker one, and sometimes it's, it's the dominant assertive one. I don't believe that is always the same one. It is according sure. to the presentation that yeah. is there. So we always believe that everything is in communion. Yeah, and there are four communion. scales. Yeah. The four scales, and you can be anywhere on mm -hmm. those scales. Yeah. The, pr mm -hmm. the problem for people that are out on the extremes of the scales is they can't, they're blind to the people on the other end of the scale. Mm -hmm. And that's my affliction. Excuse me. <laughs> Bless, Bless you. you, which has to do with flow. So here we Boy, have also, the mm -hmm. flow. Cool. I think also, the too, the shyness. Talks about that balance. <laughs> Say that again, Rhea. I think the next paragraph talks about that balance. That yeah, flow. you want to take that on? You want to get into 87? Well, sure, why not? Okay. In other words, read it. Yes. yes. Oh, all right. In extroversion and introversion, it is clearly a matter of two antithetical natural attitudes or trends, which Goethe once referred to as diastole and systole. They ought, in their harmonious alternation, to give life a rhythm, but it seems to require a high degree of art to receive, to achieve such a rhythm. One must do it quite unconsciously so that the natural law is not disturbed by any conscious act, or one must be conscious in a much higher sense to be capable of willing and carrying out the antithetical movements. Since we cannot develop backwards into animal unconsciousness, there remains only the more strenuous way forward into higher consciousness. Certainly that consciousness, which would enable us to live the great yea and nay of our own free will and purpose is an altogether superhuman ideal. Still, it is a goal. Perhaps our present mentality only allows us consciously to will the yea and to bear with the nay. When that is the case, much is already achieved. Yea. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, nice i liked that a lot i um i was a shy child and you know i was in a duo dancing team with my sister who was born a ham to the tense power and i remember <laughs> you know having to be kind of threatened once to get out on stage and do this little dance we were doing at the i don't know the lions club or something but you know as time went on um, I realized that I really didn't like performing, but I continued in life and I did perform. But I would rather perform with an orchestra than be a flute soloist, for example. I would rather play piano with a group of people singing than have a solo part. So, so what, right? It's just the makeup of one's persona. You know, I became a popular high school teacher. I was very, I could be a ham, I could be funny. <laughs> but it wasn't my nature particularly. It's just mm. you, know, you grow into that balance as you understand, well, there's a beauty in staying home for four days. And then there's a beauty in going to a party and just being a big old Leo, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, what's great about that is I was thinking while you were reading that, it came to me that, okay, well, what am I shy about? And it's not generally shy, but there I'm, I was trying to go through the little Rolodex of, well, with some questions, maybe I pull back and I'm kind of shy. I don't know about that. I, that's kind of. And then other times I'm just jumping right in. So it's the balance of what I am and what I am not shy about started to come to mind as to just a discerning feature as to. Okay, well, where where am I too heavy? Where am I too light? Or simply, where am I weighted? And where am I 
light. Um, just thinking about that. Um, well, a lot of us have seen grandchildren or great nieces and nephews come along and we see that they just seem to have a nature. One is ready to get in the center and show off like mad and the other one really wants to just sit over next to their auntie and watch for a while. Mm -hmm. so right. Um, I do think it's a really big piece of DNA there. I think the you're right. The in the group would know a lot more about that than I would. Now, with, within that, I've always watched that even though these traits exhibit, that if one remains watching, there's always uh, something, let's say the older sister is taking up the space. No, or, it doesn't or, have and to be they, the older sister. It or the young one. There's one. always a dynamic from which that particularity developed out of and is causing that that particular uh, behavior to be to be the one that exhibits a lot of times it's not simply there out of uh, but but th th there can be something that helps it become what it is even in young children it, it, it's usually seen is this what Jung cares about, though? I mean, I thought his introvert extroversion thing had to do with something quite different than what we're talking about. Nick, can you uh, comment on that? Well, I think that um, just the idea of introversion and extroversion for him has to do with um, how, it, how one um, activates their personal libido and how that's expressed, the gradient through which that is expressed. So um, it's probably different in some nuanced, nuanced ways. Mm -hmm. How about we get into this next chapter? Mm -hmm. I mean, this next sure. paragraph. Uh, who would like to do 88? I'll go. Okay. Paragraph 88. The problem of opposites as an inherent principle of human nature forms a further stage in our process of realization. As a rule, it is one of the problems of maturity. The practical treatment of a patient will hardly ever begin with this problem, especially not in the case of young people. The neuroses of the young generally come from a collision between the forces of reality and an inadequate, inadequate infantile attitude, which from the causal point of view is characterized by an abnormal dependence on the real or imaginary parents, and from the teleological point of view by unrealizable fictions, plans, and aspirations. Here, the reductive methods of Freud and Adler are entirely in place, but there are many neuroses which either appear only at maturity or else deteriorate to such a degree that the patients become incapable of work. Naturally, one can point out in these cases that an unusual dependence on the parents existed even in youth and that all kinds of infinite infantile illusions were present. But all that did not prevent them from taking up a profession, from practicing it successfully, from keeping up a marriage of sorts until that moment in riper years when the previous attitude suddenly failed. In such cases, it is of little help to make them conscious of their childhood fantasies, dependence on the parents, etc. Although this is a ne necessary part of the procedure, and often has a not unfavorable result. But the real therapy only begins when the patient sees that it is, it is no longer father and mother who are standing in his way, but himself, i.e., in essence, an unconscious part of his personality, which carries on the role of father and mother. Even this realization, helpful as it is, is still negative. It simply says, I realize that it is not father and mother who are against me, but I myself. But who, in italics, is it in him that is against him? What is this mysterious part of his personality that hides under the father and mother imagos, imagos making him believe for years that the cause of his trouble must somehow have got into him from outside? This part is the counterpart of his conscious attitude and it will leave him no peace and will continue to plague him until it has been accepted. For a young people, a liberation from the past may be enough. A beckoning future lies ahead, rich in possibilities. It is sufficient to break a few bonds, 
the life urge will do the rest. But we are faced with, with another task in the case of people who have left a large part of their life behind them, for whom the future no longer beckons with marvelous possibilities, and nothing is to be expected but the endless round of familiar duties and the doubtful pleasures of old age. <laughs> Damn. Well, I, I can tell you about those. <laughs> wow. What a paragraph. Yeah, let me read the next one because I think these go together. Two-part idea. If ever we succeed in liberating young people from the past, we see that they always transfer the imagos of their parents to more suitable substitute figures. For instance, the feeling that clung to the the feeling that clung to the mother now passes to the wife, and the father's authority passes to respected elders and superiors, or to institutions. Although this is not a fun, although this is not a fundamental solution, it is yet a practical road which the normal man treads unconsciously and therefore with no notable inhibitions and resistances. Thoughts? Yeah, Hello. part of this, the, these two paragraphs that really um, to me is the pivot is when he says, it will continue to plague him until it has been accepted. Um, and in the, uh, you know, numinous quality of these, let's call it these workshops, right? This work that we've been doing <laughs> as a group and the way that there are always um, some kind of coincidences. I was anticipating that this evening something would explain to me the behavior of a woman on Saturday who sat on a couch next to me and explained that five years ago when I wrote her a letter and I said, as a board member, myself a board member of this organization, for one thing, I would like you to donate a little more money this year to this nonprofit. And I also would like to see you showing up at more events. <laughs> and she was completely floored by that for five years. I have seen her many times since then, but on Saturday, two days ago, she sat on the sofa and she said, how dare you write in your handwriting on a beautiful, you know, all cotton paper cranes card, you know, like these words to me. <laughs> <laughs> and the people whose house we were in started yelling, stop attacking Annabelle, right? But now I think I see what it is. Mm. And I yeah. really didn't. I really didn't. I, I mean, I may be wrong, but I think that I had assumed a role of a figure of authority, mother, mm. father, something, which never occurred to me until right now. And that I'm not sounds right have, on. Yeah, you know, like you were tr you were triggering a mother or father echo of I I don't want to be told what to do kind of thing. Exactly. That, that makes it petulant and not discerning. Right. She didn't want to be told what to do. Thank you, Jordan. See, I was I, and I was traumatized. I was like, oh, "What do you want me to say?" <laughs> yeah, because she's coming in with the gloves on. I mean, how dare you? It's like on this nice. How dare you soil this nice paper with? with the, the torment of your words five, years. Like five <laughs> years ago it's like wow you want to talk about taking a while to get around to uh, um defending <laughs> yourself <laughs> but i think but that is, i think is what the will continue to plague him until it has been accepted and i think yeah. that part of what this is is that i don't know when this woman is going to start accepting whatever it is that she's going to start accepting but it took her five years to get to the point of even saying bad mommy you know yes. <laughs> right be nice next time and she even mm -hmm. expression she said she said i'm from the south and we have better manners than that and I, well, you, you know what's interesting i'm from the south Arlington, virginia but i was born in brooklyn 
Well, I, I, I'm from the South and I will, I'll say she was trying to be nice. You were trying to be kind because you're looking for the, the overall nice is superficial. Nice is scared. Nice is tentative. Nice is icing, but there's no cake in there. It's just icing, but mm-hmm. kind looks for the bigger picture and you were basically pulling some garden weeds in the garden and telling her you need to fill in these spots, you know, to be make the organization better. You, it's, mm-hmm. it sounds like. You know, well, this gives me a thought <laughs> that, uh, like these paragraphs are emphasizing, you know, it's it's a a discipline and it's a goal toward higher consciousness to balance the two sides of ourselves and. I also have had experiences with Southerners. I was on a student ship and I think there were only like two Midwesterners and the rest were all from the South. But they they were so different from me. I felt like another species. It was very mm-hmm. odd. And um, the one fellow who found me to talk to was from Chicago. And he said, it's so nice to find someone who will have a real conversation. Mm-hmm. And as what he meant and then I lived for four years in Austin Texas which is really the liberal bastion of Texas but still Mm -hmm. I just learned that wait a minute we are we northerners are way too direct and I don't know if that has to do with extroversion or it just has to do with the culture and we midwesterners think that those New Yorkers are again another two times way too direct right you know Rhea that's spectrum of stuff wait um, you know in yeah. the u.s itself and you know you probably needed i i missed i had to go turn off some cooking but but you know we need to do two or three paragraphs of praise and how's the weather and <laughs> and that, that before we actually get to the point whereas most of us i was you know you just get to the point and some people are just oh wait no 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 you know and my sister who went to west africa she said no you know in ghana you never ever come to the point mm. oh. you greet all the elders then you greet all of the mothers and then you greet everybody better and then you bow and then and finally you circuitously come to your point that's a whole <laughs> lesson you know um, and I don't know if it has to do with introversion or extroversion, or if it's just <laughs> right. if it's just a cultural aggressiveness. It's a cultural piece. I mean, I think Americans are both kind and egalitarian, but also very aggressive mm-hmm. in terms of getting to the point. I've seen it in many parts of the world, and I'm sure most of you have, and probably Skip has a huge amount to say about this. Well, you know, Ray, I'm glad you brought up the northerners being quote unquote more direct than southerners and at the same time it's like okay rattlesnakes and mesquite trees the stuff is going to kill you so southerners will get really direct really fast on some things but i remember the first time i met someone from new york and we were in texas and um this woman told her she goes oh bless your heart and later she said that woman was so nice to me. I'm like, no, when someone says, bless your heart, she's taking pity on you. She thought whatever it was, was like weak and absurd. Bless your heart is not a compliment. It's a dismissal. And, and it's interesting because then that's not direct at all. It's actually covert and, and, and almost passive aggressive, but it's, it's complete dismissal. Um, Whereas I, I maybe even because it's colder in the north, so you got to get to the point so you don't freeze. I mean, you got to get back inside in a way. Um, I don't know if that is a factor. Well, I'll share a story about the north, and I'm not from the north, and there's something to it. Living in New York City for 21 years, when I moved somewhere else, such as Vermont, I would be in the grocery store pushing that cart like the devil was chasing me. And of course, the energy my my body had it had, had absorbed for so many years living in an extremely busy area, uh, probably one of the one busiest area in the world, like next to the Empire State building and across Macy's a block away from Madison Square Garden and three minutes away from Times Square. Um, 
it was embedded in my in my whole being. It took me years to undo that uh, nervous movement that was already there, embedded for survival, because that's the only way you were able to play along such an environment. So there's something to the environment that colors the person. And we always say, well, there, it's, all, it's the person, but the environment has a lot to do with how that person develops. And of course, no environment is gonna, is gonna come and say, oh, please let me change you to a, be a better person. The person has to do it themselves, but there is no question about, it took me years, like I said, to get the New York City out of my being. And I wasn't born in New York City. I went there to study. So I didn't arrive with it to begin with. It had to, it, it got pounded into me. And I used to walk around with, with in order to, to, to be able to live there to begin with as a, as a, alone as a single person, I used to walk around with my headphones listening to music and I thought I was in a movie. So I would walk around all the time pretending I was in a movie. And that's and and until the whole energy, which is really intense, to at the highest intensity you can imagine, was embedded, just embedded in 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 everything, in the auric field, in the quality of 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 movement, reactions, and everything, because that is the only way that my being, that the person can survive in that environment. So, so is that just, why everybody? There are so many people walk around with earbuds in it's actually a self-defense mechanism. Well, the noise level was so intense. Uh, it, it, as I understand that it, it, you know, according to what a human being uh, level of that, it, it makes your nervous system buzz, you know, because the noise is really noisy. So you're, 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 you know, when it's not a, a, a a cop or, or an ambulance or buses. I mean, it, it is, it's, it is like, uh, I used to say it's a thousand people per square inch, right? So there's this, the aggression is built in. You have to have aggression. Otherwise you'll be stepped all over in no time and spit out. It is just the nature of the rhythm. Well, and that's, and it's traumatizing. Like just, to, just to kind of, uh get a word in edgewise for the south here um <laughs> uh, you know i i born and raised in north carolina uh, i still live here she, and she, I, she's from marshall she's from marshall north carolina who is the woman who oh really where yeah. is marshall do you know somewhere it's not terribly far from Asheville, i don't think okay cool. I, you know it's like you know, 300 people for, you know, gotcha. thousands of miles around. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds like probably a fair characterization. Um, yeah. I was just going to say that I, um, I, I still relate to what you all are saying uh, deeply. I often find myself having conversations with people, whether they be in uh, family, friends, coworkers, just, you know, native Southerners and North Carolinians and find myself just being like, will you get to the damn point? Like, what are you, what are you actually saying? What's beneath all the garb and all the stuff that you're cloaking, whatever point it is you're trying to make in. <clears throat> and, you know, I don't know if um, there's something in there about like, <clears throat> a detachment or a disconnect between relevance and meaning and that kind of thing. But I find that it's been kind of a um, personal preference for me to distance myself from a lot of people that I know or have known because they make me very um, nervous and uncomfortable in a kind of um, neurotic way, because it just seems to me that there's a lot of kind of conversational covering going on where it's like, People want to talk and talk and talk and all the while never actually say anything and never allow a break in conversation or a moment of silence. And I'm just of the type that I would prefer to sit in silence until I have something genuine to say rather than just continually 
keep checking in with this meaningless thing and that meaningless thing. So I, 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 that's a difference that I've had to kind of work out between myself and family members and stuff like that. I mean, much like Skip's characterization of the introvert at the party. I mean, that's me at a family get together too. If I'm lucky enough to find that one person to talk to, but often I'll just kind of sit off to the side and be like, God, what are you people talking about? <laughs> well, I was always moving around to new duty stations and I would come in and there would already be a click there and everybody was, you know, everybody knew who the who the the good guys were and everybody knew who the smart girls were and and so on. And I was always odd man out. So I just would shut up and go about my business until people started to approach me. And then they would find out that, wow, he might be a little interesting, right? So uh, let's see a show of hands, including Rhea now. How many people have people that they communicate with three times a week who went to high school with them? Okay, Jordan, I see no other hands. <laughs> well, I have two women who have been communicating with me since 1962, believe it or not. And since we had text messaging, every, probably three times a day. Um, and it certainly, and we were never romantically involved with one another. None of us were. And yet, um, we share a common interest in horseback riding, actually. Uh, but, you know, they, I, I just was in California, and on the 4th of November, I stayed in the home of one of these women, and uh, it was lovely. Uh, and uh, it was just the two of us, and we had fun talking. Um, and uh, she wanted to show me her lovely home and I wanted to see it. So <laughs> anyway, uh, that's been my experience that I always had to wait until people came to me. And uh, it's probably for an introvert, it's probably a good thing to do. Um, it's just go about your business until somebody comes to you. I think I can show you a picture of this home and the though i cannot show you a picture of the woman who does not wish to be photographed sadly it's interesting about the you know let them come to you kind of thing um my mom always chastises me she goes you'll resurrect some dead person on a bus or on the street corner to start a conversation it's like yeah. it's, you know and it's just different it's interesting, Nick, when you were talking about that, though, about the get to the point piece, not that Jung doesn't have a point, but some people speak in that stream of consciousness one long paragraph rather than, you know, intro, piece, conclusion. And, and I've always found it interesting as to if you do, you're concise. If you don't, you're effusive, except there's that's it's not black and white but I, I get your point but it seems to me that the longer form tennis rally of the things that take longer to speak through instead of just snippets um and again balance yeah i uh, i mean firstly i would just say that i have a hard time reading young for that reason um i mean of course i still do i kind of muscle through um <laughs> and of course i extract a lot from it but i often do find myself particularly when we're reading these like two page long paragraphs just like come on man like you probably could have said <laughs> what's the boy a lot man? more succinctly yeah. particularly in this last paragraph i mean like he pretty and much made his point in like two or three lines and then after that mm -hmm. it's like i i kind of i don't i, I don't know how he gets to the end of the paragraph exactly <laughs> Anyway. Well, and, and no, well, and I was sitting there in a in a sandbox. I was a pee in a pod. I'm like, oh, I love this paragraph. This is like a toy. I mean, I so I was on a joyride, and and you were going, mm, 
mm -mm. and it's interesting because it, neither is right or wrong but it's just i was resonate i that's one of the reasons i love Jung is that it goes on and he, he really gets in and digs and digs and like you said he may have made the point in the first two three sentences then he's fleshing out finer grain larger and smaller it feels like to me and i feel that it's Maybe it's a little Baroque, like too much <laughs> ornament. <laughs> it's just little. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. Rococo. Um, yeah, I, I think it's I think it's a mixture of two things. I've talked about this a lot with a friend of mine in Asheville, but he's for whatever reason he's he's obsessed with typology and has been obsessed with saying Young was an INTP. And he thinks that that really comes through in his writing style, since he has this kind of meandering writing style instead of just being very J and succinct and getting to his point. Yeah, quickly. That's, right, that's why I love him. Right, mm -hmm. right. You're an INTP as well. Yeah. And that, and, you know, I can appreciate that. I think that, you know, if that's what you signed on for, then it's not a problem. But uh, there are certainly times where I just find myself wanting it to be a little bit pared down. But that's not to say that. Yeah, Edinger says it's like uh, it's like having a cheese ball or a, a, a fruit cake. <laughs> fruit cake. At, yeah. A fruit cake at, right. a, yeah, at holiday time. A fruit cake. Every paragraph is like a fruit cake. It has a meaning. This fruit cake has a meaning, but you have to get all the bits of it. So, for people like me who were taught to write. Hemingway style um, you know I read his paragraphs and I say well geez we could have turned this into 50 paragraphs <laughs> right and, and and that wouldn't be wrong but it's not young mm -hmm. um, and you know, so yeah go ahead I just I, I was yeah, happy that he divides this section into the young people and the older people because, you know, I don't know if it's in this book, but he starts out very clear about life has these two sections. Yeah. And we've discussed it at length. I kind of would be liking us to go to the next paragraph, which is mm -hmm. more me, the person who's really at the end. Not too close to the end, but still. Um, the one that's what, put part of, what, he has put this part what, of the what, book. What paragraph are we talking about? 90. 90 yeah. okay go on well somebody else i'll go uh, ahead and continue if you want yeah, Enjoy, Annabelle, if you want to go yes, right. this evening the problem for the adult is very different he has put this part of the road behind him with or without difficulty he has cut loose from his parents long since dead perhaps and has sought and found the mother and the wife or in the case of a woman, the father and the husband, he has duly honored his fathers and their institutions, has himself become a father, and with all this in the past, has possibly come to realize that what originally meant advancement and satisfaction has now become a boring mistake, part of the illusion of youth upon which he looks back with mingled regret and envy because nothing now awaits him but old age and the end of all illusions. Here there are no more fathers and mothers. All the illusions he projected upon the world and upon things gradually come home to him, jaded and wayworn. The energy streaming back from these manifold relationships falls into the unconscious and activates all the things he has neglected to develop. Yes. To, to me, that's almost a definition of the midlife, the midlife crisis, um, which some people never have. Some have at 35, some have at 50, and some have at 70. Yeah. But well, it reminds me very much of a conversation I had with my father last week when he was saying how everyone is dead, you know, and um, reflecting on this, some of this, um, uh, you know, the idea of looking forward. But he is 101. Wow. Nice. Yeah. 
Good for him. So he may be yeah. having a midlife crisis, but <laughs> he's going for Yoda midlife crisis <laughs> somewhere. I don't know what. Well, I, you know, I understand that, but what we found last week is that that there is a a, a fount of creativity that makes one young again. Exactly. And, and so we had this 90 year old woman who organized this whole big event, which uh, Rhea was there. We met there, didn't we, Rhea? And, yep. uh, and she's the liveliest one of the bunch, honestly. Uh, Colleen is absolutely the light, uh, the light of, the, of the group that we were with and all of them, including the, the guests on Saturday night. And, um, you know, we all sparked off one another in a special way that I don't think we quite have words for yet, but uh, we did recognize that instead of having a one-off event next June, the event actually started May 7th of 21, and it's really rolling now. It's already really rolling. And I, I don't know, Red, did you feel at all renewed just by being exposed to those people? Um, well, I've been exposed to them all on Zoom. Yeah, I suppose. And so it wasn't a huge leap up, but I do think that this sentence, the energy streaming back from these manifold relationships falls into the unconscious and activates all the things he she had neglected to develop. And so the people that I met there are all in that continuous development stage. I mean, we had therapy, we've had analysis or we study ourselves and we, we see, whoa, there's a whole pocket. It gets opened or lanced and suddenly you have a whole new energy to to do a confluence or to do a yeah. new set of sculptures or to, to join or to open a new class for other people. So in that sense, um, you know, for the, the next sentence in the young man, the instinctual forces tied up in the neurosis give him when released buoyancy and hope and the chance to extend the scope of his life. And I would love to just take that sentence and make it mine. I mean, mm. I'm very excited about being my age and I don't want to die yet. Too much is happening and uh, end of story. Too much is happening. Rhea, you're reminding me of the old Turkish proverb of a heart in love with beauty never grows old. I mean, yeah. where you're always finding those pockets and those treasures. That, oh, let's, let's open this up. Let's unpack this. And, that's, and that's, I think that's one of the wonderful features of being creative. Yes, keeps you. Yeah. And I, you know, I kind of want to get back to Nick. Um, you know, we we all we read John O'Donohue, or we read Young, and we read different people on solitude. And I'm not going to say either side of this spectrum gets to own solitude. Mm -hmm. But when you're excited about the higher ideas of life, it mostly happens in solitude. I mean, none of us here wrote 22 volumes of Jung. None of us did that. <laughs> but we can get very excited by him or new ideas by him or, um, you know, or as, as uh, Skip says, you know, sparking off a different mind that has similar interests or similar uh, atmospheres. So, um, you know, in that sense, yes, yeah, Skip, I totally loved that Saturday night event because it really was that kind of experience, the sparking yeah. off experience. And well, and, and uh, the difference between Colleen and my mother-in-law uh, <laughs> it, it's like night and day. I mean, it's like, it's like, you know, here's this, vivacious artist who's teaching classes seven days a week in her studio and, and not, no she's not well she's very often she is though because i try to communicate with her she says oh i have class today 
including yesterday. Um, but my mother-in-law is waiting to die. I mean, literally. And, you know, she's probably out of my living room sleeping in front of the TV, as a matter of fact. And I don't, and, and so, but that's all right, okay, because for some people, that's the right life. I mean, she has lived the archetypal mother life, and she never really got a chance to do anything outside of it, and it's accomplished, right? Whereas, um, you know, Colleen has things to show and things to prove and things to do. Uh, and, you know, I fully expect her to live to be 110. <laughs> I may be wrong. But... Well, it's that she's got, she has that always complete, never finished, lifelong quality. Yeah. Or is she just going to oh, continue? Yeah. And I, at one point yesterday, I was speaking with her just privately on Zoom. And I, I said, I said, what an amazing job that was for you to get people to bring all those things out into the garden, all these sculptures that were in the garden. She says, oh, they're there all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, Tim was blown away, right? Because I, had, I and I was blown away because uh, I had gone to Helena and I was blown away by Tim's studio. And then I went to Colleen's and my God, I said, Tim, you're a biker compared to this. <laughs> got 20 years on him. Yeah. That's yeah. yeah. 20 years of productivity, and she's the Energizer Bunny, and she never stops sculpting. But um, I wanted to say this, that the way that she honors Mary Holmes, who was her mentor and her teacher and her friend, yes. is the same way that my relationship with Colleen is. And... Um, and I am hoping that there are people tagging along behind me that are picking up cr occasional crumbs as well. I mean, that really is the purpose of life, in my opinion. Surely, surely. Well, I love that she has not arrogance and vanity. Um, she's humble, and she is a genuine teacher and a genuine artist. No doubt. And, and she brought, she took us to Mary Holmes's place which I don't think she had been to in like three years, although she had a great role in building it up over the years. And, um, you know, whether consciously or unconsciously, she wanted us to see it. And mm -hmm. she wanted to hear what we had to say, and we have had a lot to say about it. And, um, and she's already doing it. I mean, the, the stuff that we said, she's actually already doing. Maybe we reconfirmed what she needs to do. But, um, but the, you this, know, I had the honor. Go ahead. Well, the this place, Mary Holmes's place, is just a, a really unique gem. I don't. Well, I don't think it's unique necessarily. I told Tim, you know, I think that there are conclaves like this all over the country because I know of two or three more in, in you know, places that you wouldn't expect, but they have to be saved. And, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, the problem is that Mary built it up with great love with Colleen's collaboration. They both built it up. And, um, and it's a phenomenal place. I, I mean, I don't know if I really explained it, but it's she... like a little, it's like a chapel made from recycled stuff in a way, like tubes that used to be tubes to build roads, right, Skip? Yeah, and culvert. Inside, she... and inside are a whole selection of Mary's large, very feminine paintings. paintings. They're right. like typically six feet by five feet. Yeah, and that's what he's talking about. It's like and there's actually three chapels. It's actually three chapels under in which one, under one roof. Yeah, and what she did was she took culverts, great big culverts, and uh, she found some broken ones, I guess, on the road or something, 
And so she said, bring those along. Those are going to be the pillars of my chapel. Yes. And she just set the four of them up on the corners of her chapel or concrete in them. <laughs> and, and she's got pillars. <laughs> and, uh, and then she had um, uh, her son brought home a paper mache angel uh, that that he thought was nice, but it was cheap and the store was going out of business. And uh, he said he bought it for a buck and a quarter or something. They probably wanted 15 or something to begin with, but they're angels about like this and they're paper mache and they're beautifully painted in the Philippines. And uh, Mary took one look at the angel and she said, go back to that store and buy every single one. And then she put, put Velcro on all of them and put them in the ceiling. And man, you know, then you, then you have the heavens filled with angels. Really incredible. And, uh, and then there's, there's a women's chapel, which was very interesting um, because the deal is men are not allowed to go into this chapel. It's women's mysteries. Professor, and, Professor Mary Holmes taught for over 60 years. Yes. Somebody's listening to something about Mary. Anyway, uh, she, uh, uh, she created this chapel about women's mysteries. Men, women, men are not allowed except certain selected men. And Colleen says, and you're all selected. Interestingly, one of our number, I won't say who, refused to enter this chapel uh, because he didn't want to know women's mysteries. <laughs> and... Um, and, you know, in the end, I mean, you get to be an old, old dude like me and you know these things anyway. So that's why we were invited in and it was truly necessary for us to see it. But, you know, there's a central chapel, then there's this women's chapel and then there's this wisdom chapel. And the problem is the place is falling down around their ears and her children are in their 60s and 70s and probably are not up to saving it is what I guess. And so we have to find a different way. And, uh, hey, Skip, do you mind if we, uh, if we get through these final two paragraphs in this section here? Go for it, Nick. Okay. Cool, so 91. In a young man, the instinctual forces tied up in the neurosis give him, when released, buoyancy and hope and the chance to extend the scope of his life. To the man in the second half of life, the development of the function of opposites lying dormant, dormant in the unconscious means a renewal. But this development no longer proceeds via the dissolution of infantile ties, the destruction of infantile illusions, and the transference of old imagos to new figures. It proceeds via the problem of opposites. It's interesting, you know, in that um, long paragraph 88 he also chooses the language problem of the opposites rather than uh, tension of the opposites or something like that yeah okay and in 92 the principle of opposition is of course fundamental even in adolescence and the psychological theory of the adolescent psyche is bound to recognize this fact hence the freudian and adlerian viewpoints contradict each other only when they claim to be generally applicable theories but so long as they are content to be technical, auxiliary concepts, they do not contradict or exclude one another. Psychological theory, if it is to be more than a technical makeshift, must base itself on the principle of opposition. For without this, it could only reestablish a neurotically unbalanced psyche. There is no balance, no system of self-regulation without opposition. The psyche is just such a self-regulating system. Amen. And we, and we see that that's exactly what's happening to us in current events. Well, yeah, you have a whole adolescent loss of adulthood that never occurred. I mean, in a way, yeah. you know, we, people, I mean, we're two generations in of the children, the kids running the family. And because three generations ago, two generations ago, 
kids were still angry at their parents. Don't tell me what to do. And and now we see that then there's, you know, entitlement and self-righteous, petulant, immature, and differentiated. I mean, I would just list it go on and on and on because there aren't the opposites. There's just, like Jung said, thinking is difficult. That's why most people judge. And so people, the thinking part requires both and, and not just one. Yeah. Well, it's going to be interesting to see how this manifests over the next five to 10 years, because, um, you know, as I look at the one, the January 6th people, um, you know, they got energized by Trump, obviously, uh, but then they didn't know where they were going. They had no direction, really. Mm. And they got to the Capitol. They got into the chambers of commerce. And then what? You know, they had no clue what to do. And, you know, the, and I recognize those people. They're the salt of the earth. You know, those are guys that kept me alive in Vietnam. Uh, but, you know, it's, they have to start seeing life in a different way way i think they're starting to see it in a different way as as some of their numbers go to go to jail and and trump doesn't come and stand by them and they start to get it <laughs> but it, it'll yeah take it's time. pretty interesting how um in an earlier paragraph young talked about how and you know he's paving the way for what comes in the following um chapter where he starts to unpack the concept of transference, but he talks mm-hmm. about the transference of the of the father image onto institutions mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And he even alludes to this concept of of the father as thunderer. And it's so interesting, you know, he's making an allusion to Odin or Zeus, both gods of uh, thunder and lightning, and Odin particularly of thunder and lightning, and also a war god. Mm-hmm. it's pretty interesting to think about how you know there might be some aspect of kind of transference of this archetypal father onto institutions in the case that you're talking about and how these i guess i'm not really familiar with the uh, group of people but i would assume it to be primarily men involved so most of them were men yeah, yeah. And most of them were fat cow potatoes who four of them dropped dead from heart attacks during the event. And, and so, you know, they were looking for some renewed energy of youth, I think, in part, and they needed a, a leader to lead them on. So that's what our president did. Um, yeah, well, I'm sure they got that too, but it's really interesting that in the one case, it's like that they find the gradient for the expression of that libido or that unconscious. Precisely. That's exactly, energy. yep. That's exactly what it was. Of, but in the case of the container of analysis, that transference is encouraged. They're encouraged to transfer all of that stuff onto the analyst and then use a reductive method to work through it and say, look, that's not me. That's something that's within you that you're now projecting onto me and we can, parse out who I am and who this image that you put onto me is and hopefully help you to take that back. And they help them integrate that energy in in a helpful and and healthy way. Whereas in the case of uh, the the January 6th incident, I'm sure it was expressed and then fell right back into where it came from. Well, yeah, the, the abject lack of an adult sense of discretion and discernment is so bited into the Cheshire cat, you know, the, any, if you, if you don't know where you're going, any road will lead you there. That's that kind of (laughs) Trump leadership, you know, he doesn't know where he's going. He's just trying to not be bankrupt 19,000 more times. I mean, you know, it's like, he's he's trying not to go to jail. Well, yeah. And it's demagoguery. Yeah. If he thinks he's, if he thinks he's president, if he's president, then we can't put him in jail. That's his theory. And yeah. And it's, Demagoguery, which is negative cheerleading. I mean, it's... Uh, Rhea, go ahead. Rhea. Something, uh, historic spectrum here. I'm not sure I'll say it right. The idea of making the revolution 
some people have said it's easy to make the revolution. It's hard to follow it through and you know create the thing that's supposed to follow. Mm -hmm. I was thinking of the French Revolution and I was also thinking of the Russian Revolution and how the, the, the other maxim that comes to my mind is not that part of it is that people didn't really think it through. I mean, they had an ideal. Yeah. Liberté, égalité, fraternité, they had that. And so, did say Marx, so, and so did Marx and Lenin, they had that. But I'm thinking that really, when I think about January 6th, I am not horribly alarmed. And I think it's because I believe that for every action, there's an equal reaction. And if you study France before the French Revolution, you see something quite different than what we have in this country, where most sure. people are in fact eating. Yeah. And in Russia, where you had that whole, uh, is it the Kulak class or the, the, you had the peasants and they were suffering horribly under the, yeah. under the czars at a certain point. And the reaction was great. The czars family got gunned down. And sure. I think in a certain way, the fact that January 6th was as mild as it was, is a testimony to the fact that the extreme situation of the people who barged on just isn't that extreme their families are not starving yeah the, the, they are they not are, under duress they, in that way they could have gone there with bombs they could have yeah. done something so much worse and i just feel like you know historical perspective i'm a historian i mm -hmm. think a historical perspective counts for a lot in terms of action and reaction i think that well, the ship state in this country is quite stable and it takes a lot of time to turn a large ship in the water. Once I saw that in the Milwaukee Harbor, I understood the metaphor. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it, could, I, uh, could I read a quote quickly that I think sure, is sure. to what you've just said here? Um, I've been reading a book recently by a, um, a Frenchman named Pierre Hadot. It's called Philosophy as Way of Life. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a subtitle called Spiritual Exercises from Socrates to Foucault. Phenomenal book. Uh, in that, he has a quotation from the French sociologist, Georges Friedman. And on the topic of revolution, I think it would be relevant to read. So this work on yourself is necessary. This ambition justified. Lots of people let themselves be wholly absorbed by militant politics and the preparation for social revolution. Rare, much more rare, are they who, in order to prepare for the revolution, are willing to make themselves worthy of it. Yeah, absolutely. The topic of uh, the French Revolution right. and all of that stuff, it just right. seemed appropriate to read that. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm a prophet, so I'm going to make a prophecy, and that is that if... Trump is reelected in 2024. We're going to lose the country, and uh, there's going to be a lot of damage before we recover it. Okay, and and the example is Hitler, where you know he was seven guys just getting out of prison in 1923, and it took 22 years and all the crockery being broken before it ended. On the other hand. If he doesn't win, which is what I expect, uh, and I, I'm not saying that a, a Democrat will win, but I think maybe a Republican will win that's different from him. Um, if, if either fact happens, Democrat or non-Trumpian Republican, then we're okay. And I agree with you, Rhea. But, you know, it's going to be that event. And the, the main thing that we have going for us is that he's an old man. And, you know, Hitler was, you know, in his early 30s when he started yeah. giving his speeches. What? 30s, right? He was, right. Huh. Yeah, he was in his early 30s. He died when he was 55. So for 22 years, um, you know, he raised havoc and he did some pretty dastardly things like he raised up the, the brown shirts to be supportive of him 
very much like Trump's trying to do now. But then what did he do? He shot all the leaders of the brown shirts on the night of the Long Knives in 1933. And so then the brown shirts didn't, didn't know what to do. Right? He killed all the leaders in his own, you know, in his own, basically his bodyguard. And uh, that was the, that was the essay. And he created his own army. And that's what he was hoping would happen with our military. But, you know, our military is not going to do that. No way. No hope. Well, Andrea, your point is really well put because, and it's actually insightful, because think about how costly are big pickup trucks and boat insurance and boats. I mean, just think, I mean, fishing is a huge sport in the South and then boats, not cheap. I mean, and a lot of people have them. So mm -hmm. you're right on the money with, it's not like they're starving. I mean, this is not that. Well, and, and okay. They wanted to have, have some excitement in their lives. So they think driving along the highway with big flags and trying to drive buses off the road is a, is a fun thing to do, but you know, it's also a pretty good way to get yourself in prison, ultimately. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, and, and people will rebel against that kind of behavior because we don't want to live that way. Who wants to live that way? Who wants any of those people that attacked the Capitol on January 6th to be a congressman? Honestly, I mean, would you elect any of those people to represent you? Most certainly not. And uh, so my expectation is that this revolution of Trump's is going to collapse of its own weight ultimately here. Uh, but, you know, there's always the possibility, as, as has been proven in the 20th century, that it could catch fire. And if it does, then we're in serious trouble for a long while. Um, I'm gonna have to jump in here and say I'm gonna have to check out. So it's Peace. been nice seeing you all, and I will see you next week. Take care. Take care, Nick. Say hello to Savannah. <laughs> I will. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, Nick. Good night. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I guess I've given I've given my profound prophecy for the night. <laughs> Great talking I, with you guys. Yeah, Ray. Am I wrong? Am I wrong? About which? about my prophecy i've heard you say it before i have no comment at this time okay fair <laughs> I enough think, i think it's being studied quite a bit and and uh yeah i'm not studying you know, it i'm I not think, i'm not studying at all i'm, I'm i mean it's obvious that it would be a big deal and a big blow to the nation if trump were elected again whether we mm -hmm. would quote lose the country i would debate that but I don't have time and I have to leave also. And thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thank, you. thank, thank you. you. Thank you for being undecided. <laughs> well, and I did with you two here too. I, I, I think even the Texas abortion thing was, was a false prompter. I mean, like I went, Oh my, what, what happened? Except now it's being there. Texas is being sued for that being unconstitutional. I mean, so it's at first I went, you know, seriously but then of course the wave come the tide comes back in and goes the other way i mean it's yeah well i mean we we see beta work running against abbott now yeah right? and that's going to be interesting because he almost beat cruz in the same right. race and uh you know i think abbott's approach has been so draconian that i i would be very surprised if he's reelected. um yeah, I'm just amazed at how red tech, I mean, from when growing up, I mean, it was primarily Republican, but the, it had a lot of purple, you know, um, but now it's, it's, it's not the place I grew up. Um, it's just not the place I grew up. Skip, do you have an escape plan? An if escape you plan. Do you say lose the country? Or do well, you? I mean, escape? I'm just, I'll, I'll just batten down the hatches and shut up. <laughs> And, and just, will, just it be to to batten, will it be possible to batten down the hatches? Yeah, I think so. It's going to take a long while to destroy the country, but 
you know, we don't have a, a existential enemy like Germany did at the time, uh -huh. right? And so there's not going to be a world war. Uh, we, we don't have an enemy like the United States here in the Western Hemisphere. So who's going to come? <laughs> you know, who's going to... Yeah, and a, and a civil war would be more of a guerrilla war because it's all everywhere, all across east to west. I mean, it's north to south. I mean, it, <laughs> well, there's and, no, and there one, is no geographic peace. And anymore. once it's really recognized as a threat, it will be crushed. There's no doubt about mm. that. You know, it, it just, it, it can't succeed in the end. Um, and, uh, you know, because, and Annabelle, this is your chance to opine. Uh, I don't think the women will stand for it, the women of America. Well, that's, yeah. So we're really going to have Lysistrata. Yes, yeah, something <laughs> like that, even worse, you know. <laughs> I mean, that was bad, but this is <laughs> Yeah, that's what a great concept. Yeah, that's a one way to get the war to stop. <laughs> like, sorry, you're war, not gonna... war is like not sustainable, especially when it comes to, you know, excuse my bringing up something trending, but climate, you know, I mean, <laughs> war doesn't yeah. work. You know, it makes things yeah. turn up and- mm -hmm. Yeah, see, the, <laughs> see this bay right here behind me? Uh, I don't know, yeah. can you see my cursor? Here, this is the Chesapeake Bay. Yes. Two weeks ago, we had water up to here. Uh -huh. And that's a lot of water. Um, it, it filled up downtown Annapolis. And it's the first time since 2003 that it, it has happened. And uh, Well, and we, had, we had flash flooding in Jersey and it destroyed the sewers, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the water system. Yeah. And that didn't last too long, but, you know, what about next time, next time, next time? I mean, it could just be six months from now that we suddenly don't have drinking water here because mm -hmm. all those petroleum companies have been destroying the aquifer, you know, along well, and the way. All the contracts across the decades in New Jersey, I mean, lead pipes and, and you know, the graft and I mean, the infrastructure is, is very tenuous. It's insane. Yeah. yeah. But I had to escape. I mean, I escaped here. I escape. I I you know, I didn't choose that word randomly. You know, it really is about escape. I escaped from Brooklyn um, related to coronavirus. And, sure. you know, mm -hmm. I escaped from a lot of coastal areas. I'm on a high area. You know, it's like those are elements of escape. You can't. Mm -hmm lowlands we can't there's a lot of things we can't do anymore and um and then of course if trump is reelected, there's a lot of just general things we're not gonna be, i mean yeah right? well, the dumb things that are gonna happen post office anymore i mean we won't be able to send a letter i won't be able to send a letter to the woman like i did and she holds a grudge for five years anymore right well, you don't have to worry about getting something back. <laughs> yeah, well, well, we'll see how long we can actually talk on Zoom and on uh, YouTube. Um, anyway. That's going to be that's going to be an issue, and uh, and so. Uh, oh yeah. Hello, hello to the eleven people that are still watching us. That's amazing. We're we're still chewing gum over here. So. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Well, as Annabelle, with your escape, I, I was thinking similar things when I was leaving Philly, when I decided last January, and all of a sudden I'm like, you know, I'm going from 400 and whatever feet to 7,000 yes. or 9,300 up in my cabin, and and it's, uh, I was like, I got, I, I got to get to Noah's dock, you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, and that's a little exaggeration, but I was just okay. Please don't have a hurricane, Sandy, before I leave, and mm -hmm. you know, and I. I think it was a month after I left. My mom's like, "Did you see? Did you see the rainstorm?" That I'm like, "Uh uh." And I look, it's like, "Whoa!" I'm glad yeah. I'm not there. I mean, Where is she uh, living now? She's in Houston, but yeah. she was talking about Philly, and I think I had been gone maybe a month, month and a half. And I was like, I was just so glad that I was up at seven thousand feet and in a you know semi arid high mountain desert. Well, and where where is your water going to come from? I mean. Well, that's the thing. When buying a piece of property in New Mexico, the first thing you do is you have to test for the quality of a well. 
you have to find your or, wife. Yeah. Or, yeah. And I mean, I was like, very tempted by New Mexico right before coronavirus. I went up to uh, Ojo Caliente. I was in Albuquerque mm-hmm. until Ojo Caliente. And, um, and I thought, this is the place, you know, I'm just going to yeah. come I'll pack my bags and come right back here. It's, it's yeah. absolutely heaven. It was, it was yeah. mostly water that made mm-hmm. me. A little nervous but i'm used to there being a lot of water around you know and that's it's interesting because we have a well at my cabin of course it's mm-hmm. fed by you know mountain runoff and an aquifer you know yeah. and it's a natural spring and i i remember that the water heater this summer was out and i couldn't get my plumber for long enough that it, you know you fire him um but you want to take, <laughs> talk about I, I almost wanted, I kept wanting to go back to Taos and just check into a hotel for actually a, a shower right. because I was washing my hair like in the kitchen sink um, so I could pour the water out and not fill the storage tanks, all that kind of stuff. But the water was so cold that my head actually started to hurt. I mean, it was that kind of, yes. that cold. I mean, it was like, what, a half a degree above freezing. And, yeah. but it's great clean water, but that's up there. You know, yeah. here. Do you have seven. any problem? Any problem with Girardi up there? No, no, it's not like not like a veil, because um, yeah. they they Colorado has that more. Um, it's so dry there. Mm-hmm. I mean, it rains a lot in in Red River, but and up I'm five miles above the the town, um, but it's dry enough that you deal more with. Uh, mildew or black mold if a place is just not ventilated like a crawl space kind of thing or if it stays too wet but yeah it's so dry that mm, not much mm-hmm. and also a 300 inches of snow i mean yeah. not at one time but that's 26 feet yeah you know once that's a year a lot, that's a lot of snow we used to have yeah. it in, in upstate new york also mm-hmm. um but well, in last February, it was 40 degrees below zero, minus 40 in February for like two that's, or three days up at the cabin. That's, that's cold. Yeah. I'm like, that's but like. It's doable. It's- I mean, I, I spent a lot of winters in, uh, you know, going to Minnesota and it's layers. It's layers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just don't want, right. Yeah. I don't want to get adopted by the Donner Party and you know, chew on my forearms yeah. and hope someone yeah, stops I me mean, in the spring. I- <laughs> right. It's but it's not life threatening the way lack of water is life threatening, you know. In that right, sort of right. Fundamental way. Um mm-hmm. I'm less worried about temperatures. Yeah, me too. You're right. Well the water is the primary piece. I mean, and mm. and in New Mexico you have to, you know, I mean, from you know, testing in Los Alamos, it's a whole different region south than it is yeah. middle and north, east mm-hmm. and west. And so you just, it's kind of hit and miss. You just have to test your water to find out, is this potable or, you know, what's the condition or can it be, there's some, some wells that you can treat, you know, but if it's a, too bad, then it's like, it's not worth it. Um, yeah. Well, we're going to have a lot of problems with water coming, mm-hmm. coming forth because Bangladesh is about half underwater. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, they they bump it out, but it it gets flooded easily, and it'll take half the country. And uh, oh, look at Venice, you know their whole engineering oh, yeah. piece to keep the ocean oh, out. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's a stopgap that'll last maybe twenty five to fifty years, but then ultimately they're they're cooked. Yeah, and um, you know those. Um, do you remember when uh, Dubai decided that they would, with landfill, create the world, would create a map of the world in islands? And, mm-hmm. and they started to do it. And, and there was this uh, you know, Dutch landfill company that you know, does it in Holland all the time. So they said, oh, yeah, we'll come in and build your islands for you. And, and so in multi billions of dollars, they start doing this. And then nobody bothered to notice that there's a current that goes from west to east across <laughs> a, a, across uh, Saudi Arabia and then up 
this peninsula where there's Ras al Khaimah and uh, some of the other emirates hmm. and, over, and around to Oman, right? And I mean, at the top of the peninsula is a border with Oman and it goes down into Oman. But, um, you know, some of those places just uh, washed away. Washed away, yeah. It's yeah. like, right. that's going to be the, the rivers, the ocean's river. Um, right. Yeah, Neil says they they chemtrail over my city early on clear mornings, crisscrossing turns into a cloud. Not good. Uh, and Neil says radio communication if the net goes down. Well, who has radios like that anymore? I mm -hmm. ask. Um, yeah, ham radio or some kind of. Yeah, I I still have. Chucked away in a box somewhere. A um, what was that called? And I used to get radio shows from you know like CB and Russia, Russia. Wow, well, like a ham radio or it wasn't a ham radio. It was um, and it had like six dials. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know yeah, what I mean. That, yeah, I know yeah. what you're talking about. Anyway, I never yeah, had I one, but. I it never was a had one thing. I mean, I couldn't use it just anywhere, but I would go up to the mountains and then I would, you know, like in the middle, and it was only in the middle of the night, but then I could bring in all these radio stations. Shortwave. It was a shortwave. Short yeah, shortwave. That's yeah. it. Yeah, a friend of mine had that. He's like, you got to come over. It's clear <laughs> night. We can hear this thing from Brazil. And we couldn't yes. understand a word, but it was like cool that we could hear something from Brazil. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And I used to get all excited about uh, about shortwave and you know being a ham operator, but by the time I got to the point where I could afford a ham set, it was over. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I know, I know. Right, and, and it was really uh, you know computer networking and email networking that had taken its place, mm -hmm. and, and so. You know what happened? I met my wife online, and we're the first couple to meet online and marry. You know, before you were the, the first. Yeah, we claim so. Nobody. Yeah, has, yeah it sounds, sounds. Nobody. Nobody has disputed us. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. I, the, okay, so I'll give you the dates, and I'll give it the dates to the YouTube audience. The dates are August twenty second, nineteen eighty five, is when we met online. And mm. August 29th, 1985 is the day we met for the first time physically. Mm -hmm. and, and we married, well, we moved in together four months later, but we, uh, we got married uh, about four years later. And, um, and I've never heard anybody claim an earlier no, date. Yeah, no refutation. Yeah. You know, it's so, interesting. The other other week, um, and then once at the cabin, um, once in a storm, shaking the bus gutter so the power goes out. But then, when a transformer here blew, and and then when the neighbors here leave left, and that the router needed to be reset, mm -hmm. and it was the interest that whole shortwave radio sounds kind of delicious, right? Yeah, it sounds so like what? without electricity felt like I was a, like sounds delicious right now because mm -hmm. I, I without electricity or just without the internet I felt it took me about an hour just to walk out the front door and I felt like I was on a desert island like oh mm -hmm. I can't talk it's like just leave <laughs> go go outside get in your car drive away but it it was the wildest thing that we're so accustomed to that and everything yeah. requiring electricity and what to do when there's not. I mean, it's just like why the phone system, when you have it hooked to a wall, two pair of wire, the power goes out, the phone doesn't go out. You know, I mean, they were separate. I mean, that was intentional, but now, I mean, we all have these, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. and, and that's so fragile. Yeah. I mean, we, we can so easily be cut off from that. Mm -hmm. and, and we're back oh, yeah. to we're back to tin cans and strip 
<laughs> and string, yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah, that where I was... raised my daughter upstate New York, when we would um, when we would lo lose electricity for one reason or another, the raccoon, you know, chewing on something, um, we had a stream, be uh, which was a good thing because oh. the water pump. <laughs> was electric <laughs> oh, it was yeah. an astounding thing i mean and i could keep all the water i wanted to but it ultimately wasn't really a help because you didn't want to have that stagnant water that was sitting around all the time what are you gonna do fill the jars once a week or whatever you know it yeah. just uh so yeah we kind of you know in some subtle way depended on the stream and sometimes in practical terms we were actually d depending on the stream yeah mm. Well, that makes a little bit of sense because I mean the pump at my cabin is electric, and you right. know I, I have to leave the power on till the end. I mean I have to drain the water heater, I have to pump the tanks, um, the you know the, con the containment tanks because if the acreage is too small backed up against the Carson National Forest, half of it goes this way, so there's no leach field. We're on the front part of it, and right. so you know it's just two thousand gallon tanks. So people are like, well, why don't you Airbnb it? I'm like, because you know I'm gonna get some party and six kids come in they're going to be taking hot showers all weekend and all of a sudden why is the front lawn all watery it's like because you just use two thousand gallons of water yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah yeah you know by the way here's your bill <laughs> yeah exactly yeah <laughs> here's the four hundred dollars to pump the tanks and then here's the bill and it's like <laughs> yep yep um well, it's lovely chatting with you. I need to oh, sleep. Oh, exactly. And yeah. we have a. Uh, uh, we we will do this one more time next week, um, and I guess we won't miss a week, be because of Thanksgiving for Monday night. But for uh, Wednesday, we'll mm. have a class on Wednesday midday, and then that will. The following week, we're not going to have one. Okay. Thanksgiving week because I'm going away. Um, cool. But we'll be coming back soon, so we keep, Jordan and I can keep our chit chat going on <laughs> on so Sunday we, morning. <laughs> you know, somehow Jordan, you know, we we have almost the most audience from this for this group for that conversation. Wow, it is, it's, it's, it's not early, early anymore, but it's early enough. I mean, it's, yeah, well, it's, uh, yeah. it's nine but, Eastern. I mean, seven here, but when we were doing it at seven, even, um, which I'm glad we switched it because that'd be five now, yeah. <laughs> which would be little. Yeah, that'd, that'd be, be rough. The, well, yeah. let me just tell you how many people we got for the last time, which was uh, yesterday. Uh, we had 63, oh, yeah. we had That's 63 really views. Yes. Since yesterday, average view duration, 14.24 minutes. Peak That's a while. Time. Yeah. Because YouTube wants you to get at least 10 minutes viewing time from people. And so the fact that we are getting 14 minutes, that's incredible. It is really. Yeah. And I, I, I'm enjoying it because of the fluidity of, you know, we come prepared or we don't, but we can always figure something out. And, and we, even if we start prepared, we then range off that topic into something and then bring it back around. And it, it's, it's been fun, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. It's been good. It's been good. Um, so anyway, I've enjoyed it, Jordan. And, and, uh, you know, there, uh, and you're you've become a, a star of the show too. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> appreciate the accolade. Yeah. Much appreciated. Yeah. I mean, uh, we we've come full circle on that one. So Adam, yeah, <laughs> how how are you for Thanksgiving? Are you gonna have a well, my father, you know, 101 years old, is right now in the hospital down oh. at Tom. He went into the emergency room this morning, uh, which is to say it was like one o'clock in the morning. And, mm. uh, and then they decided to admit him. 
And the, one of the most disturbing things about it is that when he first was in that emergency room, he was flailing around on the bed and very angry and trying to rip his clothes off and rip his diaper off and rip, you know, the get out of, you know, I got to get out of here, which is not his personality type. Mm -hmm. I mean, I sh shouldn't sound like I'm laughing, but I am. And then, you know, within a few hours, he was flirting with the nurses and he was telling <laughs> stories about the <laughs> to Cincinnati or whatever, you know what I mean? He was back in that. So there are some mysteries about what's going on with him and they sounds like good drugs to me <laughs> yes. vomiting. he was vomiting and they couldn't make him stop so they put him in an ambulance and they took him to the hospital so you know the hospital the doctor's going to figure out whatever they figure out and at 101 like that could kill him you know we don't know what's going to happen mm -hmm. but on the other hand i have tickets to fly down Next Thursday, Thanksgiving Day. I like to fly mm -hmm. on the holidays, on the day, Christmas on Day. day. When, I went to, when I went to New Mexico that last time, I flew on Christmas Day. Okay. And as a result, when I got there, they said, well, you can either have a Mustang or a Lincoln Navigator. Where <laughs> nice. And I'm going up north. They said, we're just going to have to give you a Lincoln Navigator for the same price <laughs> as the compact car that you reserved, you know. It's another because yeah, they're all out of everything else. It's <laughs> right. It's another yeah. thing about flying on the holiday. Anyway, so I have my ticket and that's where I'll be going. Um, nice. Do make sure you plan all the Thanksgiving festivities around your dad's dates. When he's, no, when he's flirting. No, no, no. <laughs> we don't do festivities. Um, and an interesting thing about my not last trip down there, which was Labor Day, but the trip before that, which was in June, he explained to my daughter, who's 31, that throughout my childhood, we had absolutely no holidays except Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. We had no Christmas. We had no nothing, you know, um, which my daughter was astounded by. I mean, much as I've told her, she didn't believe me. <laughs> so yes. anyway, so that's my plan for Thanksgiving. But as I told my supervisor today at work, because I do work nine to five, um, I may, you know, run down to Newark Airport at any moment and fly. Mm -hmm. I was ready to fly today. I had all the flights, you know, lined up when I would go. Um, so we'll see how what tomorrow holds. I don't know. But the plan is to be down in Florida just Thursday to Sunday and then uh, come on back do some work till Christmas and then go on down again, probably for a few more days. Cause I have a little more planned holiday in advance for mm -hmm. Christmas. Although I didn't, I didn't book during Christmas quite yet, but that's okay. I mean, JetBlue mm -hmm. today, if I would have flown JetBlue today on their 1220 flight, which is the one that I was ready to, if it really was an emergency right away. And if I would have flown back tomorrow with 3 PM, you know, just mm -hmm. to go down, take care of business and come back. I have power of attorney and all that. Um, that was going to cost me $240. Even today. That's it? Yeah, that's it. Wow, so, that's like legal theft. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's not always like that, but that's what it was today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so I'm just ready to go down. So that's my Thanksgiving plan is just going down. See my yeah, my, my travel to the West was not expensive. Oh, um, yeah. How'd you do? What did you fly? I flew uh, Southwest to Oakland. Oh, yeah. uh, and that was 334 or something. And then I flew Delta from, uh, from San Jose to Helena. Uh -huh. that, that was like less than $200. And yeah, the prices are really low. That's not bad. Right? And then that's, uh, that's when they get you is when you're going from, you know, middle of America to middle of America, you know, not from coast to coast, usually. coast. Mm -hmm. to coast but, but then I flew from Helena to Baltimore again via Denver. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that was only 224, I think. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. When I flew here, even this summer, um, Philly to Albuquerque and then shuttled here. Um, it was under 300. I think I got, there was some, I took a, one of those take the mystery flight 
you don't get to choose who or what and but it's going to be really? 200 221 dollars and everything else was 690 or 800 you mean and like I, somebody like kayak it was a mystery flight on one of those yeah actually it was on it wasn't kayak it was um cheapflights.com mm -hmm. or, or was it cheapo air i think no it was cheapo air but they on the top they had this mystery flight it'll be on the day you will arrive the same day you know it's not like oh, i'm going to take anything and then it's, you know we can't get you in for six weeks um and it wasn't you know at some ungodly hour in the morning it's like mm -hmm. left it left at 10 30 and arrived at you know three or whatever or four mm -hmm. um and it was it was under 300 dollars, closer to 250 and mm -hmm. i went well what the heck i'll just see you know what i'll just have some fun and yeah. you know take a book so i don't have to suffer if it, something gets delayed obviously or just buy one in the airport and everything went off without a hitch but everything yeah. i think what it is is when i went to pick my seats uh -huh. there was only one seat left so there was no choice and what it was was this we're gonna we're full we've made our money we're gonna make an extra 250 dollars just to fill this one seat i mean mm -hmm. so it, it's pre your profit wow so I, I think as if someone, a friend of mine is a flight attendant said, that's exactly what it is. Um, because so, they're basically, they can, they, they don't need to fill that seat, but if they do, it's 200 free dollars. I mean, or, yeah. so. Right. so, so Jordan, where, where are you going or what are you doing for Thanksgiving? I'm, I typically stay, if I've recently moved, I typically stay in the place I'm in. So mm -hmm. I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to be in Taos. Um, I might head up to Red River. Um, but the cabin's all turned off, so um, mm. I might not. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, yeah. it's, I could see myself driving up there, and then a big snow comes in, and I I'm stuck in my cabin, and I can't get out. <laughs> can, can Can you work in uh, the lobby of one of those hotels, like that hotel that has that incredible those incredible paintings? It would be great if you could do your tarot in the lobby. You know, the, actually, that in that the was winter the time. The Nativo Lodge, which is in Albuquerque, with those mural rooms. Mm -hmm. That, yeah, I'm looking at that actually. And then I was the image came to me of reading, uh, doing tarot sessions by a fireplace, so a lodge or a spa um, mm -hmm. over the winter. Was so what's interesting, or or up at Ojo Caliente, right? That kind of thing. But what's interesting is mm -hmm. that was my winter plan forming this summer. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But honestly, I, I'm still reading on the plaza outside. It's been 60s and 65 and 70, and we'll probably get a couple of days of snow, and then it'll go right back. So the forecast this fall is just going forever. Um, yeah, it feels a little bit like Denver. But, right? but you do have that in mind to do some inside work. Yeah, I do. I do. And I've got a couple of shops that have asked me, too, if I would um, spend a good portion of the winter in their shop as a mm -hmm. draw. For them oh, wow. also yeah so that's going great and then honestly the mask sales are starting to actually become a winter plan wow. um, yeah it's like i laugh i think i gotta catch up <laughs> it's like, yeah. but it's it's kind of cool because that's working better than i thought it would but it's nice with the weather um i've set it up to where you know if, if nothing happens it's fine um but it's all working out and so it's just one of those once the weather hits and i have of choices to make um were you, yeah. doing, were you doing any outside readings in philadelphia no i was nothing all like Zoom. yeah nothing like yeah, what noth we're, you're doing now not at all in fact it, it wasn't it wasn't receptive in a way i mean mm -hmm. i set up once and it was just there's kind of a people walking by pretty fast in a way that you get the carny vibe like they think, oh, there's the fortune teller. It's like, well, and that's clear fraudulence. <laughs> that's not what I do. Um, yeah. But sure. so now, I, I a couple of times I set up and it was just it's zero. And I think too that it's all my clients then. You know, Spain, um, Australia. I mean, I almost it's all Zoom calls. Yeah. You know, and I think my biggest consideration was trying to groom the Aussies. You know, people from Oz not to have me read for them at three in the morning, my time. So yeah. it was ultra convenient for them. It's like, guys, look, you know, everything in your country will kill you. I think we can move the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
so but yeah. Taos has completely been receptive um in fact it's um I was out yesterday um and I was out Friday um, I'm taking Mondays and Wednesdays off because I'll be starting that TV show on Wednesday evenings mm-hmm. and we have our Wednesday 11 to 1 but it's it's the perfect place I mean it's wow. people are interested and curious and 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 it's not the it doesn't have the carny vibe people mm-hmm. go hey can I sit you know and they sit and good session and i uh i laugh because i um in red river where is it i learned not the hard way to i I just come up from taos and so you know i've got this which is my uh little uh looks up to the app on the phone you know, push the button, get the uh, green dots, connect it, you know, slide in your credit card. Here's this. Turn my phone around. You can click the tip. You click, do you want to receive by text or no receipt? And so just a little square card reader. Mm-hmm. But just, I mean, I can just keep it in my pocket. I mean, yeah. so I'm, I laugh that I, people are like, you always have a tarot deck? It's like, I'm usually packing. But now I'm always, it just stays in my backpack. So, and it's, it works great. Um, Mm -hmm. Some people's paying cash rarely, but you know, but, um, but yeah, so in Philly, I didn't. um, And for Mm -hmm. the the reason that it it didn't work for me there. And I think something about it too, is um, I was still kind of in that transition, you know, into the architectural well-being gig. I'd kind of flipped into and, so I don't think I was as present there in a sense I was paused and I mean, as you, in Philadelphia and, mm-hmm. and I was miserable there. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And it, it's not so much Philly as it, as it is. It's just not a match for me. I mean, I love the people in my neighborhood. I just didn't like being there. Where, where um, were you? What part of Philly? Um, Northeast or North. Yeah. Northeast Philly. I think Taconi oh. Mayfair. Mm-hmm. which is it's it's a little older 50s yeah, do, you, do you know where nassau avenue is Mm-mm. that's up in northeast also mm. uh, it's where my grandparents used to live oh okay and uh, visited them a few times but then they ultimately sold out in the 50s uh, they just got too old and, mm-hmm you know, it's like fun. the suburbs there too are so different than the suburbs I grew up in. The suburbs there are pastoral. You get Flower Town, Ambler, and Spring House, and and that's pretty cool. You get a lot of green and trees, and and it's yeah. just there's so much asphalt, chain link, and concrete, you know, in Northeast Philly that it's the architect in me was like, you know, the aesthete was absolutely miserable. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I which is a little I snobbish, lived, honestly, but at the same time. Uh, I lived in Lafayette Hill for four yeah. years. Yeah, yeah, that's near uh, Flower Town. Yeah, Plymouth Meeting. And Miss uh, Meeting, right? Yeah, Plymouth White Marsh High School. That's where I went. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know the typ- typical fifties uh, high school vibe. Mm-hmm. I was in, I was mainly in junior high school there, but then I went off to. Japan, where it was quite different. <laughs> mm-hmm. Totally, yeah. totally. Yeah. So I think the East Coast experience for six, six and a half, six years was was important. Plenty. It was, yeah, yeah it, it was, yeah, it's plenty. You but out? It, what's that? <laughs> rounded you out. Well, it rounded me out, and also the East Coast, told, New Mexico. I don't yeah, know. yeah, exactly. It, it told <laughs> me, oh, okay, I now absolutely know I do not call that home. So right. yeah. it's a great place to visit, you know, but. I'm sure I'll, you know, drop back in here and there, but, but it wasn't home. And Taos was, I mean, I don't think I've ever felt as home anywhere in my entire life as I do here now. Yeah. Um, well, that's good. That's yeah. Good. And I'm closer to my mom and my stepmom. I mean, they're both in Texas, one in Houston and one in North Texas. Um, so, you know, that's just a hop, skip and a jump. Yeah. You know, yeah. either like a, you know, eight hour drive or just hop on a plane. Um, yeah, so it's nicer to be closer to family, 
Um, I got to wrap this up. I'm, All right. I'm great talking to you guys. It. Nice to right. see you. This see has you been later. lovely. Yes. Yeah. Okay. See you soon, Annabelle. Good luck with your dad. Thank yeah, you. So definitely. Much. Definitely. Yeah. Just, Bye -bye. Uh,